In the last 10 years, there have been 12 rookie running backs who went on to produce at an RB1 level in the second half of the season after not starting a game in week one. It's happened at least one time in every season since 2013, bringing us guys like Alvin Kamara, David Johnson, and Jordan Howard, and the odds are that it will happen again this season and having that guy on your team is pretty much a cheat code to winning your fantasy football league. So what the fuck is up? My name is Noah Hills. You can catch me on Twitter at Noah More Parties. Let's figure out who this season's league winning rookie running back is going to be. <laughs> Going back to 2017, the average RB2, or the RB24, in a given season, going back five years, averaged 12.4 points per game in PPR leagues. The average RB12, or like back-end RB1, averaged 15.5 points per game in PPR. And the average RB5, or guys that we could consider, you know, elite RB1s, top five running backs, averaged 20.0 points per game. There have been 19 rookie running backs since 2012 who didn't start in week one and then had at least 12.4 points per game in the second half of the season. So who produced as at least RB2s in the second half of the season. Some of those guys are Javante Williams, uh, Buck Allen, J.K. Dobbins, dudes like that. That's nice, but we're not interested in RB2s. We want RB1s, we want elite producers, and one difference between the elite guys, the RB1s, and the RB2s is that RB1s generally come from better offenses. With our sample of 19 rookie running backs who would go on to produce as RB2s after not starting games in week one, the RB2s among them, the guys who, who produced, um, you know, less than 15 and a half points per game, but more than 12.4 points per game, came from offenses that were ranked on average 16th in the league. So completely average. The RB1s in that group came from offenses that were ranked 15th on average, 14.9 actually on average, so a little bit better. And the elite running backs, the guys who scored 20 points per game or more in the second half of their rookie seasons came from offenses ranked 6th on average. And Brandon Gadula, really smart guy, writer at Number Fire, put out an article, I believe earlier this month, using data going back to 2012 and found that 37% of RB1s, whether they're rookies or not, so just the, the entire sample of RB1s going back a decade, 37% of them came from offenses that were in the top eight in number fires like, you know, proprietary offensive efficiency metric. More than a third of RB1s come from elite top eight offenses in overall offensive efficiency. 67% of them, so two thirds of them, come from top 16 offenses. So offenses that are average or better. Just 11% of RB1s in the last decade have come from bottom eight offenses. For RB2s, those numbers are 24% of them come from top eight offenses, 49% of them come from top 16 offenses, and 24% of them come from bottom eight offenses. So an RB2 is just as likely to come from a bad offense as it is to come from like a top eight nearly elite offense. Whereas for RB1s, it's much less likely to come from a bottom eight offense than it is to come from an above average or especially an elite top eight level offense. So especially toward the elite range, we want running backs from good offenses. And another thing that separates RB1s from RB2s is early involvement in the offense. Jordan Howard is the only guy among these 19 rookie running backs who didn't get a single target or a single carry in week one of his rookie season. The average amount of week one opportunities for these players who would go on to produce as RB2s or better in the second half of the season, the average week one opportunities, even though these guys didn't start games, for the RB2 finishers was 5.9. They saw an average of 5.9 targets and carries combined in week one of their rookie season. The RB1s of this group saw an average of seven opportunities, seven targets plus carries. And among the elite guys, the guys who produced at 20 points per game or greater, they had an average of 14 opportunities opportunities in week one of their rookie season. So we want guys from good offenses and we want guys who are as close to the depth chart as possible and ideally already involved in week one are likely to contribute very early on in their rookie seasons. Our first criteria there where we're looking for guys on good offenses eliminates rookie running backs like Kenneth Walker on the Seahawks, Brian Robinson in Washington, Damian Pierce with the Texans, Tyler Algier with the Falcons, and Snoop Connor with the Jaguars. I'm not a fortune teller, but all of those offenses are probably not going to be very good. Just playing the odds here. If you're taking shots on a rookie running back, expecting, you know, hoping for him to be an elite producer at the end of the season, it's probably not going to be one of the guys on those teams. Criteria B, guys who are going to be like involved early, 
eliminates pretty much everybody drafted after the fourth round in this year's NFL draft. So that leaves us with, you know, assuming Brees Hall starts in week one for the Jets, that leaves our candidates for this year's late round rookie stud running back as James Cook, Rashad White, Tyrion Davis Price, Zamir White, Isaiah Spiller, Pierre Strong, and Hassan Haskins. Let's break those guys down. Hassan Haskins, I think, with the Titans, at best, he's Deontay Foreman this season. Last year, Derrick Henry was really good on a points-per-game basis before breaking his foot, going down. Deontay Foreman essentially stepped in and just, like, had that role. He didn't get as many touches as Derrick Henry did. He wasn't, you know, quite as effective in fantasy as Derrick Henry was, but he was, like, the sole RB1 on this team, and he averaged 11.6 points per game from Week 10 to Week 18 last season. I'm not sure that Hassan Haskins is like that much better than Deontay Foreman, if at all. I'm not sure that we should expect him to produce at a much greater rate than what Foreman did last season, even if Derrick Henry goes down. The next guy is Pierre Strong, and with him, I'm not sure that he's the pass catcher that he needs to be yet. Despite averaging 7 yards per carry at South Dakota State at the FCS level in college last season, he averaged only 9.1 yards per reception, which is in the 41st percentile for like NFL draft prospects, and most of them come from, you know, like D1. They're not playing at the FCS level. So he wasn't averaging very many yards per carry. His yards per target was just 6.4, which is also in the 46th percentile, so still low. And his catch rate was less than 70%. He had a 22nd percentile catch rate while playing at the FCS level. And then Lance Zerline does all of the like rookie scouting at NFL.com. In his kind of profile breakdown of Pierre Strong, he writes, quote, he lacks third down value at this time and has quote stiff hands as a receiver out of the backfield so at this point he wasn't efficient in college you know well-respected film analysts big time film analysts don't view him as some sort of like pass catching back at this point in his career even though he's like a smaller guy with athletic juice he's not much of a pass catcher he's kind of a tweener right now but even besides that even if he's a good pass catcher even if we assume he's a good pass catcher this is a very crowded backfield in new england he would probably need injuries to multiple players in order to get like a requisite workload to where he can produce as an RB1 in fantasy in the second half of the season. RB2 production may be in play. I do not see Pierre Strong being an RB1 producer in fantasy, even if like Damian Harris goes down with an injury. Zamir White is the next guy. And with Josh McDaniels now in New England, bringing over, you know, at least a version of the system he's run in New England for several years and beat reports out of Las Vegas. Sounds like they're going to be running some sort of like committee backfield. That's good for Zamir White's floor as a guy who comes in, you know, presumably behind Josh Jacobs with a couple other guys mixed in, but it's bad for his ceiling because even if Jacobs gets hurt, like what's the best case scenario here for Zamir White? I think best case scenario is he's like Damian Harris from last season. And Damian Harris had a touchdown rate that was more than double league average last season. He was scoring touchdowns on a per carry basis more than twice Twice as often as running backs league wide. So ridiculously like unsustainable touchdown rate for Damian Harris last year. And he carried the ball 200 times for the sixth highest scoring offense in the league in New England and still only scored 14 fantasy points per game. So not even at you know, an RB1 level on a points per game basis. So even if Zamir White scores a ton of touchdowns and has a ton of rushing volume, like if Jacobs goes down, he'd have to catch as many passes in the second half of the season as he did in his entire college career in order to produce like an RB1. He's not a pass catcher. He got 17 passes in college. He's a two down grinder. I think he's a good player. He's good for, you know, what he is for the archetype of player that he is. I don't see RB1 level upside in this offense for this particular player. The next guy is Tyrion Davis Price, who I talked about a little bit in my Elijah Mitchell video from earlier this week. And the case for him becoming an RB1, you know, towards the end of the season is that Elijah Mitchell did the exact same thing on basically the same team last season while scoring only two touchdowns in the second half of the season. So Elijah Mitchell did it without the help of like a bunch of touchdowns. I don't know why, you know, Tyrion Davis Price couldn't come in here and do the same thing. There's nothing really that immediately disqualifies him. Like Elijah Mitchell's not a great pass catcher and wasn't productive as a pass catcher last year. TDP doesn't need to be that in order to produce as an RB1 in this offense. This is a great system with a run-heavy philosophy, and I've seen speculation from beat reporters and, you know, analysts that there will be more inside zone, you know, kind of read type plays with Trey Lance at quarterback instead of Jimmy Garoppolo. And so if there's more like inside zone versus outside zone, that is, you know, kind of conducive to what Tyrion Davis Price does. I could see him, you know, if Mitchell goes down or, you know, something fluky happens and Tyrion Davis Price ends up as the starter at the end of the year on a really good team that runs the ball really efficiently, he could be an RB1 in fantasy towards the end of the year. 
The next guy is James Cook, who is on a great offense in Buffalo, got second round draft capital, and has a very dynamic skill set. And I believe, even as early as, you know, early in the season, he's got a legit shot at producing like an RB2 in this offense. But I do think that RB1 level production is out of reach for James Cook in Buffalo. The average NFL team had running backs carry the ball 368 times last season. The Bills running backs carried the ball just 310 times last season. Running backs league-wide accounted for 84% of total rushing attempts across the entire NFL. The Bills running backs accounted for just 67% of their team's rushing attempts, and the Bills are one of the pass-happiest teams in the league. In neutral game script and early down situations last year, when the playbook is essentially wide open, you don't have to throw, you don't have to run, it's first and second down in, you know, like a normal game situation, you can do whatever you want, The Bills were number one in pass rate in those situations last season. When they're able to do whatever they want, they want to pass the ball. And they did it a lot last season. And when they did run the ball, a lot of the time it was Josh Allen. And relative to the rest of the league, it was running backs very infrequently. Maybe they drafted James Cook with the plan to run the ball more. I think that's, you know, possible, I guess. But he averaged five carries per game in college. He had 10 or more carries in a game, only five times in 46 total games in college. And his career high in carries in college was 12. This is not a high volume rusher. He's only 199 pounds. It's much more likely that they drafted him for his receiving skills. And with Josh Allen going back to his time as a rookie, since he entered the league, there have been 10 running backs who played with Josh Allen, who had five or more targets in a season in that time frame. Just just five targets. All you got to do is be like barely involved as a receiver to, to meet this threshold. I've been looking at like route running data and targets per route run data and developed a metric called route adjusted target earnings, which describes relative to like league-wide targets per route run, how often is a running back getting targeted given the routes that he's running? And a number of 100% would indicate that you're being targeted at exactly a league average rate. Above 100% would be that you're targeted above league average given the routes that you're running to whatever degree. Like 130% would be you're being targeted 30% more often than league average. And then anything less than 100% would be the same thing in the opposite direction. Those 10 Josh Allen running backs with the Bills have collectively been targeted at an 84.3% rate you know, relative to league average targets per route run. That's so that's 16% less often than league average. That's in the 15th percentile. So Josh Allen is targeting his running backs very infrequently on a per route basis. And the only running back of those 10 that he targeted at an above average rate was LaShawn McCoy back in 2018, where McCoy's rate number was 105%. So just barely more than league average. And that was the same rate number that David Montgomery had last season. So collectively, Josh Allen running backs have not been targeted at a high rate on a per out basis and the one guy who was targeted at an above average rate on a per out basis was only targeted as much as like David Montgomery was targeted last season. I don't see a whole lot of pass catching upside here for James Cook. I don't see a whole lot of like rushing upside here for James Cook. I also don't see, you know, especially high receiving upside for James Cook. And if you go back to 2012, among running backs who are at least five foot ten and 205 pounds or less, James Cook is five foot eleven and 199. So among running backs in kind of that same range of like relatively tall, relatively skinny, there have been 12 guys in that mold who produced at an RB1 level in points per game in the last 10 years. Among them, only Christian McCaffrey is a guy who you could say played with a running quarterback. Other than that, it's like Jamal Charles and Alex Smith was the most like run heavy quarterback. And Alex Smith was more like mobile than he really was like a a scrambler. And so unless James Cook is Jamal Charles or Christian McCaffrey, I don't view him as a guy who has like super high ceiling as an RB1 level producer in fantasy, at least this season. The next guy is Isaiah Spiller. And the case for him is really simple. Like I don't think Isaiah Spiller is particularly good, but if he's the sidekick that the Chargers have been looking for, like they've tried Larry Roundtree, they tried Justin Jackson. They tried Joshua Kelly. Ever since leaving, losing Melvin Gordon, they've wanted to plug somebody else in who can kind of compliment Austin Eckler. If Isaiah Spiller turns out to be that guy, which is a possibility, and if Austin Eckler gets hurt, then Isaiah Spiller is a three down back on an elite offense that gave Austin Eckler the fifth most goal line carries in the league last season. He could be an RB1 in that scenario in the latter half of the season. The last guy I want to talk about is Rashad White, and he is the chosen one. 
He's six feet tall. He weighs 214 pounds. He runs sub 4.5 in the 40, and he averaged 1.34 yards per carry greater than his teammates at Arizona State in college. That's an 80th percentile mark. He's big. He's fast. He's an efficient runner, and he had a 98th percentile target share last year. He's a good receiver. He was targeted at a 75th percentile rate on a per route basis. So he's a target vacuum, and he's not just a check down artist. These are not just screens and swing passes and throws to the flat. He had 80 88th percentile route diversity, running a, a large variety of different types of routes. He was especially used heavily on angle routes, like a Texas route out of the backfield, option routes where he's like reading a linebacker and cutting in or out, used heavily on those types of routes, which are both A, advanced, B, very valuable on a per route basis, high yards per route run on those routes, and those are the same routes that the best receiving running backs in the NFL excel at. Christian McCaffrey, Alvin Kamara, JD McKissick, Austin Eckler, all these elite pass catching running backs are really good on like angle and option routes. Rashad White has the same thing in his bag. Situationally, Rashad White is on a really good offense in Tampa Bay. They finished second last year in both yards and points. Maybe they're a little bit worse this year with no Gronk. You know, they lost Antonio Brown. Who knows? They're still going to be good. And they've been willing to feed a three down back. Last year, Leonard Fournette had the seventh most weighted opportunities in the entire league among running backs, finished as the RB4 on a points per game basis in PPR, and had 84 targets, the third most in the league among running backs. However, he only averaged 5.4 yards per target, which is decent, but league-wide, running backs averaged 5.34, so he was barely better than league average on a per-target basis as a receiver. So just very mediocre, you know, efficiency as a receiver, despite very high volume. There's an opening here for a skilled receiving back with some juice. That's Rashad White. Reports have come out saying that Leonard Fournette is like 260 pounds or he was a couple weeks ago or whatever at, you know, OTAs. Nick put out a really good video earlier in the week about how, you know, that's that's kind of bullshit. It's probably just, you know, coach speak estimating his weight. Really good video that you should check out if you're kind of interested in that report. But whether whether you're like worried about that or not doesn't really matter. The fact of the matter is, is that Leonard Fournette has a history of inconsistent conditioning and inconsistent play. Like he's he's not been a super reliable dude in showing up to training camp in shape. And even if he gets in shape, he's not been super reliable year to year, game to game in like producing well and producing efficiently on a per carry or per target basis. You kind of don't know what you're going to get on a season to season level with Leonard Fournette net and he's now 27 years old if he goes down if his conditioning is bad and he gets injured or if he just you know tears an acl randomly whatever happens it doesn't have to be because he's he's fat now if leonard fournette goes down for any reason rashad white could be the bell cow back on a prolific offense led by tom brady and david johnson's former offensive coordinator and if that happens he will be the league winning asset this season in fantasy football